All right. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming today. So let's see. The, the topic title that I chose today is crossover fabrication. And then I guess I'm thinking of taking another look at how we're doing precision metal fabrication, what we're doing, how you're doing it, when you're doing it, why you're doing it, and so forth. And I'm really, with this presentation, hoping to just kind of get people thinking about um, possibly different ways that they can utilize machines or departments or um, any different ways that you can look at, you know, uh, what can be done, when maybe what can the press break department do that the, uh, that the turret department or punching department is doing, uh, maybe the press break could do it better, or what, what could the turret department do that the press break part department is currently doing, and, and maybe the turret could do it better. Um, or maybe the turret can do something that will make the press break's job a little easier all these kinds of things, and I'm really not going to have as many specific examples as I might like to have, but uh, just trying to get people really kind of thinking about what could be done. So on this next slide here, I kind of tried to sketch out what I kind of envision as a, a typical precision metal fabricator. Um, and if you kind of picture the, this group of slides, maybe as kind of a factory layout, so on the top left, you've got your receiving, and then as you move clockwise around the, the slide, you've got shearing, blank cutting, deburring, tapping, press break, and so on around the room. And that's kind of the, the typical theoretical layout that I think a lot of people might agree that when you sketch out your factory, that might be kind of what you would have in mind if you were to describe how things worked in your factory just in a, in a quick 30 second discussion would maybe kind of jot those typical departments down. So, you know, you, here's your first department. You receive your stacks of metal. Typically, they next go through the shearing department. Those blanks get cut down to some different size. And then somehow you cut those blanks into a, a shape, a flat shape that's going to maybe be bent up or become a final product. Then after the cutting, a lot of times they have to be deburred. A lot of times you have to tap or insert some hardware. Then you have to bend the parts in many cases. Then you typically might need to weld. And you might have some assembly, maybe multiple parts go together, or some of your corners that were bent up and meet together might have to be uh, riveted or some sort of thing like that. Somewhere along the way, you probably have some type of inspection, and that may be a, a department that the parts go to many times instead of just once here at the end, but uh, sometime there's probably an inspection. And then finally, at the end, you're going to ship the parts out the door. Now, in reality, I'm sure you find that even though you might kind of ideally think that you're going to move the parts clockwise around the room in one smooth motion, that rarely actually happens. Things really move all over the place and go back and forth and go out of sequence just because the, the ideal situation rarely happens in real life. So that's kind of what I tried to sketch out there with this line on the schools all over the place. So if we take a look at, to start with, what happens in the first three departments, receiving, shearing, and blank cutting? And I'm kind of using that term blank cutting um, because many shops these days cut their blanks in a bunch of different ways. They, they might be using a turret punch press, they might be using a laser, they might be using a water jet, or all, all of the above, who knows. Um, so that's kind of a catch-all phrase for me. Um, so typically, the first steps, you take, you've got on the top, I've got a picture there of your stacks of material, and then the next picture is your shear, and then the next picture is the punching machine. And historically, what was often done, and I'm talking 30 years ago at least probably, it was quite common to take a full blank of metal, run it through the shear, and cut your part as precisely as you could actually to the final size that it's going to be. And then when you went to the punching machine, you punched just just punched the holes in the machine in the part, maybe notched the corners. And then oftentimes that part needed to go back to the shear to maybe have the trim strip cut off or 
or possibly in the punch press, uh, you punched maybe two parts at a time, and then they had to go back to the shear to be sheared in half to, to cut the individual sizes. Historically, that was kind of what was done. Um, and the, my picture in the lower left corner there tries to show kind of one of the results of that. You wind up with an awful lot of dropped little sheets, leftover sheets that you try to keep track of. So it's, it's kind of a lot of back and forth between the material storage and the shearing and the punching and then back to shearing and then you know, back and forth a lot. So uh, my point in talking about this right now, saying that it's a, maybe a 30-year-old or even older process, is that used to be kind of the common way of doing things where I think most of you would agree in most cases now, you don't do very much, if any, shearing of your of your blanks. You probably go straight from the full blanks straight to the punch press or the laser and com completely cut your parts out and then certainly try to avoid going back to the shear. So I think I've got a poll question here. Do you shear your blanks to size before you go to the punch? Uh, or do you maybe send them back to reshear them after punching to maybe cut off a trim strip? And I guess the possible answers that I'm giving you here are, yeah, that's common practice for me. Uh, yes, I occasionally do that. Uh, no, but maybe I used to do that. I remember doing that in, in the past. Or no, I've never done that at all. So if we can take a few seconds here, if you guys can vote or, or give, you a, give us an answer on that, that would be great. Uh, it's certainly a, a practice that I remember having done, um, at least in some of the shops that I worked in before I came here to Wilson Tool. So we're kind of evenly mixed, but uh, uh, you know, if you, if you look at the top uh, three, uh, we've got a third of the people that uh, are kind of saying, "Yeah, that's that's something that they do on a regular basis," um, and then. Some people still occasionally are doing that, and, and then a lot of people are saying uh, they don't do it anymore, but they used to do it. So that's, you know, you're looking at over two-thirds of the people that are either currently doing it or, but they, or they remember doing it that way. So my next slide, thinking of a possible improvement, and I kind of already described this, in, most, in many cases people will take a full sheet or as close to a full sheet as they can and put it on the punch press and cut it out completely. And that's what I'm kind of trying to show with this picture, which has got um, you know, a, a red, large sheet of material that's got a bunch of parts nested together and punched out complete. The machine is trimming all the way around the, the entire part and punching all the interior holes and so forth. And I think many people would agree that that's pretty much become the standard in the industry um, to eat to whatever your blank cutting machine is, it's cutting complete parts, complete flat parts. Uh, the parts probably are not going back to the shear to be cut. Um, we're trying to to avoid that kind of backtracking. Um, so that's kind of my my premise is the the idea of shearing the size and going to the punch press and going back and reshearing. That, at one time, that was kind of state of the art. That was what was always done. Um, and the idea of cutting the parts completely out has pretty much replaced that in, in many shops. Um, so that's kind of my starting point is, you know, that happens over time that, that things change. You realize that the machine can be utilized in different ways. Machine improvements are made. So one thing, what happened, what needed to happen in order for for the machine to be able to completely cut the parts out. Uh, one thing is the machines needed to be faster and able to cut and more accurate to cut the parts. You might probably need a better, longer lasting tooling. Something I could have put here probably would be uh, programming systems. Back 20, 30, 40 years ago, the programming systems, the software didn't really exist to, to allow the complicated programming that's done these days. Um, so there are changes that happen over time, uh, plus people just kind of take a look back and, and find better ways of doing things. 
So what else can we look at? What's changing in the, in the industry that might allow that similar type of change to happen in other de uh, departments? So let's look at the next slide here, blank cutting and deburring. In many cases, you come from your blank cutting, you're punching, you go to a deburring department that, that's deburring the parts. One thing that is, uh, is done pretty routinely is a, a, some sort of a deburring tool can be used. So I've got a picture here of what, an example of a deburring tool that's got a little roller ball on the top and the bottom. Uh, and in the picture down on the lower right, you can see on the top right side of that part, you can clearly see the burr. On the bottom left of that part, you see the result of this roller ball deburring the part. I somewhat hesitate to use the term deburr because you're really not cutting that burr off. You're not removing the burr. You're just smashing the burr back into the sheet. But uh, it definitely is very effective in a lot of cases. And there are certainly other ways other than a ball that you can do that. You can take a coining tool and, and push that burr back in, just a uh, kind of a flat chamfer type tool on the bottom to push that burr back in. Um, there are other ways other than the deburring ball that can be effective as well. Next thing I wanted to wrap in was tapping. Tapping is something that uh, is done in a lot of shops, and it's typically done um, on a you know manual process. Uh, maybe you've got a swing arm type tap in. I tried to show that earlier in the in that picture. Um, you can kind of see that in this picture where it uh, where it shows that a person would manually tap in the parts. Tapping can be done on most punch presses these days, and there's a number of different ways that can be done. Some of the machines have built-in tapping units. What we're showing in this slide is a, is a tapping unit that drops into a two-inch thick turret station. Um, there's versions of this that work in trunk machines and thick turret machines and a lot of different machines. There are tapping tools, or like I said, some of the machines have built-in units that do tapping as well. So if you do a lot of tapping, it's something that really is a, something to definitely look at. Um, so I think this is maybe my next poll question. How much tapping do you do? Uh, it varies a lot, I think, from shop to shop. So it'll be interesting to see what people say about this. Less than 1,000 holes per month, 1 to 10,000, 10 to 100,000, or over 100,000 holes. I'd be interested to see what kind of answers we get here. Uh, the tapping tools are something that uh, can be very cost effective if you do a lot of tapping, but if you don't do very much tapping, it probably doesn't make much sense. So I think we wait another 10 seconds here and we'll see what kind of answers we get. Okay, looks like we're wrapped up now. So 40% of the people, or 38%, are less than 1,000 holes per month. Um, but there certainly are some, look at that, there's 12% of people over 100,000 holes per month. That's a pretty high volume of holes per month to tap if you're doing it manually. Uh, so there's certainly, if you're not currently using some sort of a automated tapping system, it's certainly something that I would think you should would want to look at. Alternatives to tapping are also available. Um, punch presses can easily form these thread forms like I showed in the picture here. Uh, there's a number of different ways that that can be done. Uh, they don't have the same kind of strength maybe that tapping has, but they, uh, they do have a, a wide range of versatility, a lot of threads that can be formed. Uh, something to look in and into if you just need to be able to hold a, a screw quite well in uh, in your sheet metal fabrications. A lot of people just take an extruded hole and run a self-tapping screw. Uh, a lot of these things you have already probably thought of, but never hurts to mention them again. And blank cutting and press break. This is kind of one of probably the big things that comes to my mind. There are a lot of things that are done in the blank cutting operation that um, that have a huge effect of, to what happens in the press break operation. So one of the things that I look at 
right away is what's hard to do on a press break. And one of the things that comes to mind for me is flanges that are at the ends of long, narrow parts. I tried to find a picture and I came up with this. It doesn't, not the greatest picture, but it shows that a person is bending a, a long, narrow part. And in order to hold it square to the tooling, it looks like they've come up with this somewhat complicated fixture, some sort of a side gauging thing that's, that's probably holding this part square to the tooling to help them bend that, that narrow part, that, that short little bend on this long, narrow part. So what if that bend could be done in a different way so you didn't have to do this complicated fixture? Um, and the picture I've shown in the lower right, uh, the OptiBend tool is something that runs in most punch presses, um, and it can bend like a regular press brake pretty much, up to about three inches long, three and a half inches long. And depending on the machine, you can form it uh, half inch high, an inch high, up to about three inches high on the right type of punching machine. Uh, and it can be very effective. So if you've got a part maybe like what's shown in this picture, or honestly what comes to mind, to mind more for me is if you've got a, a long part that's maybe six feet long uh, and has a little two inch long flange on the end of it. Uh, if you've ever seen a press brake operator trying to handle that long, narrow part while they're bending that little flange, it can be very difficult for them. Uh, if there's a way to do that on the punch press, that might be very beneficial for them. Another thing is kind of internal bends, which are uh, always very difficult to do on press brakes. Uh, those can be done well on a, press, on a punch press also. And this type of OptiBend tooling could do that very well. Uh, one of the advantages of this type of OptiBend tooling is that it can bend the flanges up past 90, just like you would do in your press brake. If you get a 90 degree bend, you're going to bend slightly past 90 and let it spring back. The Optiven tooling can do that as well. So what else in a press brake? Um, this is something where the turret maybe can help the press brake a lot. Um, your offset tools. If you're doing offsetting in your press brake, it's probably a dedicated setup. Um, you've got to put an offset tool into the press brake and then do your offset and then take that tool out in order to do the other bends. So that's probably what will happen this part on the top right. To do those offsets, you'd have to do that in a separate operation and then reset the machine to do the 90 degree bend. Um, 20 years ago, Wilson Tool came out with the rolling offset tool and it can do a great job with offsets. And most modern machines can handle that very well. So if you haven't looked into that, it's something definitely to look at. Another wheel tool thing is uh, cross braking. If you're doing the type of thing that you see in this picture to stiffen like a rooftop panel, or if you've got uh, heating and ventilating panels that need this cross braking, that's something that a wheel tool can do very well. And it'll have that shape in it when it comes off of the punch press. Press brake operators that I've talked to always hate having to do these cross brakes. You just kind of Clumsy and very difficult to do on the press brake. Here's a way that your, your press brake may be able to help your punch press. Uh, this louver pattern is something that we just recently made for a customer. Um, and in order to make that, that part, it would require quite a few different louver tools on the punch press. Each of those individual louvers could be created a on the punch press, but you would need several different louver tools to do that part. It would be quite expensive or you might run out of stations on your machine to do it. So a tool was made to run in the press brake to form all those louvers in one hit. Uh, here's a, a similar type of situation, uh, a card guide. Common thing to do on a punch press is to use a card guide tool to form the cards card guide slot like you see in this picture on the left. But what happens when that card guide gets too big or too long, where there are multiple shapes of card guides or lengths of card guides? Uh, press brake tooling can be made to, to do those card guides. It's just quite a simple one. It's just doing two card guides, but uh, those can always be developed in lots of different ways. So I think this is maybe my last poll question. Um, do you process forms other than your traditional straight line bends on your press brakes? And by straight line bends, I'm thinking of offsets and like 90, regular, regular straight line bends and just regular V-die tooling. Um, 
Do you do any louvers or any punching or any other type of work on your press brakes? Um, interesting to see what people say about that. I have my own opinion of what I think the answers will be, but interesting to get an answer on that. We need some music to fill the blanks here, don't we? <laughs> So three quarters of people almost are saying, yes, they do that. They do some other types of forms. 27% say no, not at all. So it's something that uh, certainly can be looked at. And I think maybe one of the things is with the advent of other types of blank cutting, uh, some of the machines, lasers and, and water jets, for example, don't really do any forming. So that's something that maybe is, is pushing more of these forms into the press bricks. And it's certainly something that that uh, Wilson Tool is looking at is being able to help that situation more, finding solutions for that. Here's just another tool, a large extrusion done in a press break instead of a punch press. And here's a, a, a concept that um, allows a, a press break adapter to be made, to be put in the, the press break that will accept, in this case, a Trump style tool, but a similar concept could be done for other styles of tool as well. So this adapter would be mounted in your machine, and then you take the tool that would normally be put in a punching machine and put it into your press break. So what about welding and assembly? Those are kind of the next things I had in my theoretical shop layout. Um, a typical hinge is something that is one of the first things that comes to mind for me there. If you're currently attaching hinges to parts in either welding or assembly, it's something you might want to look at. Could that hinge be made a different way? Um, hinge tools have been done in punch presses and or press brakes for quite some time. Um, and we do a lot of them here at Wilson Tool. Um, so that type of piano hinge like you see in this part where it's welded on, spot welded, or however, whatever kind of welds those are, uh, you might be able to just form those hinge knuckles right into your part when it's on the punch press or also possibly on a press brake. Um, corner attachments, or however you want to look at that. Pretty common to have this kind of a, what most people might call a spot weld flange, but in this case, you see we've made some sort of a, a clip, so that spot weld's flange fits underneath that clip. And hopefully that will eliminate the need then for a spot weld, at least that's the idea there. Um, that works quite well if you've got this kind of overlapping material situation. Uh, if you don't want to have overlapping material, concept over here on the left, something we call zip tech, um, it's does not require the materials to be overlapping the way they are on the right. Materials are on the same plane, but it creates clips that will snap together as the part is formed in the press brake and can allow you to, uh, to not need to spot weld that part anymore or weld that corner. Here's a concept that, uh, that I worked with a customer on where they were, uh, they had these, these parts where they were typically using mini rivets to attach one part to another. And we were able to use these clips that were inserted on the punch press. Um, and then you can see on the bottom right where the, the part attaches to those clips. And then if we just put one rivet right in the middle, that holds the part in place. The clips do the most of the physical holding, but the rivet just keeps it from, uh, from sliding back out of position. So that can greatly increase your productivity in assembly. One rivet instead of seven. Here's a case where those same types of clips eliminating needing to uh, either weld or put screws to attach this caster to the punch. And at the end I wrote up about shipping. Um, 
And I kind of had a hard time thinking of what, you know, how can the rest of your fabrication environment help shipping? But there's a number of different ways. Well, the one that I threw a picture in here of is uh, hand bending. And this also sometimes applies to assembly. Um, but uh, hand bending, if you, can, if you could ship parts flat instead of having to have them formed, it probably would save you an awful lot of shipping costs in most cases. Um, certainly doesn't apply to all situations, but in a case like this where it's a, a thinner metal, uh, this is 18 gauge, I believe, uh, we could take the rolling pincher tool and score a couple of lines in the material and then just bend that part by hand instead of having to bend it on the press brake. So we have seen situations where customers will ship parts flat and then have the end user form them by hand themselves. So I think I got a picture, a couple of pictures of other some parts. This octagon shaped part, which would be kind of difficult to bend on a press brake. That's just uh, pinched. The groove is put in that part and then bent by hand. And then this little pencil cup that we designed, that's just all formed completely by hand. So that kind of is my idea. Trying to look at the different kind of departments that you have within your shop, your manufacturing operation, and, and what could be done in a different way, done on different machines. What could uh, what could one machine do that might help another machine, or what would could some machine be better at than uh, where where you're currently doing a, a particular operation? So I have no idea where I stand on time here, but uh, all right. So if we got questions, go ahead and send them in, and so the first question was: Is there a tapping tool for a thin turret station? There is not that I'm aware of at this point. Um, There may be a solution out there. It might depend on the particular machine that you're working with. It could be, it could be developed, but I don't believe there's a tapping tool that can drop into a pinjaret punching station. And then tapping versus thread forms. Uh, when do you use one versus the other? Uh, one of the deals there is, is typically we see thread forms used when it's a coarser thread and uh, if you were to tap it, you would only get maybe one thread. Um, and that's when we typically might see a thread form. Uh, and something that's become pretty popular with the thread forms is um, there are some high strength threads that, uh, that companies have come out with that are kind of intended for the thread form concept that they, uh, they get more strength than a, than a traditional thread. So if you just take a, say, a, a quarter 20 regular machine bolt, machine screw, and try to use a thread form, you're not going to have much strength, where uh, some of these higher strength screws can provide a lot more strength than what you would get out of a traditional machine thread. Next question is a, is a good one. When running punch press tooling in a press break, are there tonnage issues that need to be considered? There definitely are, and that's something we'd encourage you to talk to your press break manufacturer about. Um, depending on the press break and the way the machine is constructed, uh, there definitely are tonnage issues. Most machine manufacturers will have recommendations on what they, what they want to see or what they don't want you to see exceeding there. And one of the definite issues there is if you, uh, if you have actual piercing happening where they're like a, with a regular punching operation when the when the punching action happens the, the punch snaps through and that can be uh, pretty detrimental to a press break so you want to be careful with that um, and certainly talk to the press break manufacturer about that in a lot of cases what we see is somewhere in the 10 to 20 percent range is what the Manufacturers will say so. If it's a hundred ton press break, they might say, yeah, "Don't exceed 20 tons with your punching type operations." Um, now, if it's strictly forming, uh, then it's quite a bit easier to uh, to deal with. Um, that example that I showed, for example, of the louvers, uh, that was just forming. We weren't actually cutting those louvers on the press break. We were just forming those, so there was 
uh, a slot cut before the, the part went to the press brake to form the louvers. So that can reduce that snap through that happens that can hurt the press brake. Something definitely something to think about. What types of punch press tooling can be run in a press brake? Thick turret, Wiedemann and Trump. Um, there's really not much restriction there. Um, uh, the one biggest probably restriction there would be the, the press brake itself. How much open height, and shut height does it have to work with? So a thick turret tool, the punch itself is a little over eight inches long, and then the die is a little over an inch thick. So you need to have at least nine to ten inches of open height on the machine in order to have any chance of running the tool. And then you've got to probably figure there's going to be some sort of thickness to whatever adapter is put in there. Uh, so that's kind of the restriction that you're up against there. It's, it's, it's the open height of the machine. So let's see. That's all the questions I've gotten at this point. Let's see if anybody else comes with, else comes up with anything else here shortly. Yeah.